In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, one God. <clears throat> it was just a little more than a week ago that I was a long way away, <laughs> visiting and serving the orphans at the orphanage in Guatemala. One of the things that the kids like to do after dinner, we had a little bit of time to be with them, is they like to play Uno. Many of you have probably played Uno, that game where you take turns going around and you play a card. You have to match either the color or the number. But some of those cards aren't really great for the person who's next to you. So you're trying to get rid of all your cards and the person right before you might play a card where you have to draw two cards. And the game began and we were going around and every time one of the kids would lay down a card to me that made me take more cards, they'd say to me, no es personal. That translates, it's not personal. The game was going on and on and on and at one point, I laid down a card and the person next to me had to take four cards. A little later in the game, it was going in the other direction, sometimes the, the way reverses. And the person that I had put that card down that had to take four, laid down one in front of me, draw four. And she looked at me and she said, es muy personal, it's very personal. They take their uno very seriously down there. When I think about what it means to get personal, I think about a conversation we had in our introduction to orthodoxy class a few weeks ago. I had made a comment that I really didn't see as a controversial comment and that one would, would not take much thought. I said that all of our prayer is never individual, even though it may be personal. That if we're at home in front of our icons, saying our morning prayers or our evening prayers, it's personal, it needs to be personal. And I made the point that it's not individual because we were all part of the church. And in the church, everything is personal. As muy personal, as the kids would say down there. We think in terms of being individuals because that's what our culture would teach us. A culture that today in the gospel our Lord called sinful and adulterous. The culture would tell us that we are all individuals. That we're allowed to get personal for ourselves because we are the only ones that really matter. And we're allowed to fight for what is right and what is ours. The church says to us, yes, it's personal. But it's also communal. We gather together for baptism, typically of a baby. And all the focus is on that beautiful young child going into the font. But what is the meaning of that if it's not that that child now joins the communion of the saints, becomes a member of the church, no longer an individual, now a person, but a person joined to the church. We offer that child or that newly illumined person holy communion. Again, we think of it as a very personal act, and it is personal. But how much more communal can you get to drink from the same cup? Or as many of our non-Orthodox brothers and sisters, they can't believe we take from the same spoon. It's become that personal and that communal. We come to confession as hopefully we all are during this Lenten season. And we think again, it's personal. And yet the church is teaching us, even by saying to us, say your sins out loud. Maybe not in front of the entire church, as was done in the early church, but in front of at least one other person. And in confession before the priest, who represents the rest of us. Again, a very personal act, but also very communal. Well, today the church 
again teaches us that our life is very personal when it comes to God. Because today God gets very personal with us. On this, the third Sunday of the Great Fast, the halfway point between where we began three weeks ago and where we're headed into Holy Week, the church says to us a very important message on this, the halfway point. We hear the words of our Lord himself who tells us, he who would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. Today we're going to process with the Holy Cross, our Lord's cross. We do this to remind us where this Lenten journey is going. It's not just individual. It is very personal. But all of us together are journeying towards his cross. And so today we hold up his cross, and then we bow down before it, and we venerate it with love. But on the same day that we do that, the church has this very important message to us. That if we're going to follow Christ, it's not enough just to lift up his cross. We have to take up our own. When we talk about picking up our crosses, it doesn't get any more personal than that. This Lenten season is one that seems to us very different. But what the church is trying to do for us is to return us to what is normal. It should be normal for us to focus our life on Christ as number one. Normal for us to rearrange all of our other schedules, all the other activities, to be able to come to church and worship Him. It should be normal for us that we subjugate even our own desires for food and subject those under our love for God, which we practice in the Lenten fast. And it should be normal for us to go out of our way, even and especially when it inconveniences us, and to do so in order to love our neighbors. All this should be normal, but unfortunately for most of us, and for all of us really, it's not. And so the church gives us Great Lent as a beautiful gift to recover that which is or should be normal. But you and I know that it's personal. You and I know in the ways that we have tried and succeeded to follow the fast, and especially in the ways we've tried and failed, we know that it's personal. All these things that hold on to us so tightly are very personal. So God gets very personal with us today. When he tells us that we must deny ourselves, he speaks to us directly, singular. Each of us must do this. Even if we do it together in the community of the church, we must each personally do this. He doesn't always speak to us personally. When he says to us, as we're going to hear in a few weeks, you are the light of the world, he speaks to all of us together as a community, not personally to each and every one of us. Most of the direction from the Apostle Paul in his many epistles in the New Testament, most of his instructions are not individual. They're to the church, to all of us as a whole. But today, our Lord speaks in the singular. Each of us personally are called to deny ourselves to take up our personal crosses and to personally follow him. So it's challenging because God gets personal today. It's also challenging because of what our Lord is saying this is all about. He doesn't say if you feel like it, deny yourself, take up your cross and follow me. He doesn't even command it. It's a condition. 
He says, he who would come after me, if we want to follow Christ, if we want to be Christians, then we must deny ourselves, take up our crosses, and follow him. So it's challenging. It's basic. If we're going to be Christians, this is what we must do. And it's also challenging because what he tells us it takes to follow him is perhaps the hardest thing of all. It's where his instructions begin, and that is to deny ourselves. I've said to you many, many times, I'll continue to say to you many, many times, the difficulty especially of our culture in this country, in this part of the world, is that so many times every day we are taught not to deny ourselves, to get what we want. And our Lord stands against all of that and says that we want to follow him. That's precisely what we must do. Because our Lord's message to us today is personal, it might seem a little bit threatening. Sometimes what is personal seems more dangerous. But today's message is anything but threatening. Today's message is the message of salvation. When our Lord says, he who would come after me and follow me, where does he go but to life? Where he's leading us is to his kingdom, a kingdom that has no end, a kingdom that has no sickness, a kingdom that has no death, no war, no disease, no sickness, sorrow, or sighing. As we pray at the Trisagian prayers of mercy for one of our departed, so this is not threatening. It's promising. Our Lord is telling us if you want to go there, here's the way. And that's something else that's very encouraging about this gospel. It's not hidden. Sometimes we pray, I wonder what God wants of me. And I think sometimes we imagine he's some kind of puzzle maker. That he leaves little clues for us. And we're supposed to go out and find those clues. That's not how God works. He laid it out for us in the gospel today clearly, crystal clear. If you want to follow me, three things. You don't have to guess what those are. You don't have to go searching for them. Here they are. And he lays them out for us, one after the other. And while this gospel is personal, it's the opposite of threatening. It's empathetic. Listen to the words that we heard in this morning's epistle. For we have not a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Our Lord is the great high priest. And as a high priest, he goes from us to stand before God. And sometimes we say we can't relate to a high priest who has nothing like our lives. People often say that to me, Father, you don't know what it's like to struggle. I'm one of you. I know exactly what it means to struggle. And today's gospel tells us that so does Christ. As a man, he endured every temptation. We think, oh, those certain things that I'm tempted with, God couldn't have been. Every single one. And why did Christ have to be tempted with every single sin? To show us that out of every single temptation, there is an escape. There is a way not to get caught in it. And the way that he escaped out of temptation and goes to the kingdom is the same way that he lays out for us. Deny ourselves, take up our crosses, and follow him. My brothers and sisters, this is what Lent has been all about. And today is the halfway point. Maybe some of us have been working very hard 
to find that change and that repentance that we've wanted and needed for so long. And perhaps now at the halfway point we say, you mean there's enough coming, as much coming as we've already passed? And if we're tired among those that would feel this way, the cross is raised up today as an encouragement to us. Don't give up. Yes, it's hard. And because it's hard, you know you're on the path. We don't wear red today because it's a nice color. We wear we read red today because it reminds us of the blood of Christ. And if it took his blood to save us, a whole lot of his blood, we're going to have to shed a little bit. It has to feel a little bit like his suffering if we're to know that we're following him. So keep going. Maybe we're not tired. Maybe Lent is just some idea we've been hearing about, but we go home after church on Sunday and we don't hear about it again till next Sunday. To those of us in that group, the church says, don't miss. You already missed half, but it's not too late. Now is the day, today, for you to pick up your cross, deny yourself, and follow Christ because it's the one and only way to life. Christ offered his love to us in a very personal way. Believe me when I tell you that his crucifixion and all that led up to it, the betrayal, the loneliness, the shame, the pain, all of it was very personal to him. And so if we're going to follow the way that he calls us to, it's going to be very personal for us. And that's okay. In fact, it's more than okay. It means that if God is getting personal with us, then we can get personal with him. Our Lord showed his love for us very personally from the cross. May the power of that love inspire us to do what it takes to follow him. May that love inspire us as he leads us out of our sin, out of all the fallenness of this world, and even through our own death. And may that love lead us to the eternal light and life of his kingdom. And now that we know the way there, let us follow that way. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit.